8. This morning I hadn't told Brother Justin where to read, and he said, "Is now First John, I think he said 3. I can't remember if he said 3, you're right? And I was like, no, I think 4. I started looking, I was like, maybe it's 3. So that's not a good start when the pastor doesn't even remember what verse, what chapter he was in <laughs> to be preaching. But I think you'll figure out why I got confused here in a minute as we start going. Okay, so we're in 1 John chapter 4. And I want you to notice this as you come across uh, verse 4. It says, ye are of God, little children. Okay, and that flash gives me a flashback of the rest of the book so far. I want you to look with me here real quickly. Look at verse uh, look at chapter 2. In verse 1 it says, "My little children." All right? And uh, and we'll come back to chapter 2 in a minute, but go to chapter 3, verse 7. "Little children, let no man deceive you," right? Verse 18 of chapter 3, my little children, let us not love in word. And then chapter 4, verse 4, ye are of God, little children. So if I asked you, who is John writing to, you might say, little children. Uh, Are we talking about actual little children in age? Or are we talking about little children as in new believers that haven't been saved very long? Well, I, I think you could kind of apply it either way, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, here a little bit. But the title of the message this afternoon is, I Write Unto You Fathers. Okay, and to get that context, we have to go back to chapter 2 for a second. But the title is, I Write Unto You Fathers. It's Father's Day, and so uh, uh, hopefully you'll understand where I'm going with this. If you go back to chapter 2, look at verse 12. And here is what has always puzzled me, and it seems like a very strange construction in the way that this, is, this was written. And maybe somebody in here has heard it explained or, or kind of has some thoughts on this. You can share it with me afterwards. I'd love to hear it. But to me, this has always been a little strange. Look at verse 12 there, chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers... Because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now, has anyone ever studied that out and says, I think I got to understand, kind of understand what he's doing there. Uh, If so, like I said, afterwards, let me know, because to me, it's a little strange as far as the construction and how it's standing in my mind. But here's, here's what I want to do for a second. And I think that you'll see my kind of theory here. And as I write this down, you'll see that at the very least, what I'm about to show you, I think we can get something from that, whether or not uh, it is the the initial, you know, uh, uh, interpretation here. But here we got two, we have three different groups of people, right? We've got little children, not necessarily in this order, but little children. We've got young men. And we've got fathers. Excuse my sloppy handwriting. Okay, little children, young men, and fathers. So now, and you notice that he says kind of, he kind of says everything. To, did I spell something wrong? <laughs> he kind of says everything uh, in, a, in a weird order here. And so let's do this, okay? Let's, every time it talks about little children, we'll write down what it says about them. Every time it says fathers, every time it says young men, okay? So let's start again with verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because... Your sins are forgiven you in his name's sake. So let's say, little children, sins forgiven. All right, what's next? I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning, okay? Known him. That is from the beginning. That's, that's one way to handle it. 
I'll write it to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked ones. All right. Now we've got all three groups, but now he's going to say it again. Now let's read the next part. Okay. I write unto you, young men, that you have overcome the wicked one. I'm sorry. Let's go back. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. What's it say here? You've known him that's from the beginning. Same thing, so I'm not going to add anything to that, okay? All right? Because you know that from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you're strong. And what does it say? The word of God abideth in you. And then it says, you overcome the wicked one, right? Okay, so, if John is saying that I'm writing to all these three categories of people, okay, and he has a message that he's giving to them throughout this, really, yeah, or look like that. That's like the sloppiest thing. That's like a doctor's handwriting right there. But anyway, <laughs> John is writing to these three categories, okay? And he says to the little children, here is what I'm writing to you for, or what I have written to you for. Your sins are forgiven, okay? If you are born again, right, born of the Father, you have been saved, one thing for sure, your sins are forgiven. I can, I can talk to you about that. Your sins are forgiven. I can talk to you about the fact that you know the Father, or you have known the Father, right? You entered into that relationship when you got saved, and now you know the Father. You're never going to stand before God and say, oh, look at my wonderful works. He's going to say, I never knew you. He's going to say, well done, my faithful servant, right? He's going to say, I knew you because you have been, you have been saved, okay? And remember, we've talked about this the whole series so far. He's talking to believers. There's no doubt about that. So you can't get confused when you read certain things and say, oh, man, I guess you lose your salvation, or I guess you're not really saved if you don't do this or that. No, he's talking to believers the whole time. And so that's very important to understand this. And so here's what he says is, uh, uh, why did you say something? I asked you if I spoke anything wrong. <laughs> so he says that your sins are forgiven and that you've known the Father. That's pretty basic, isn't it? If I'm writing to a new believer, hey, praise the Lord, your sins are forgiven. You're not going to be accounted for those. You're never going to have to go to hell for those. Your sins are forgiven. You have known the Father. You don't have to worry about him saying, I, I know you not. You know, you know him. Okay? Let's get down to fathers, right? What's the message that we get to Father? It's only one message. He says it twice. He says, you have known him. That's from the beginning. Later on, I'm writing to you. You've known him. That's from the beginning. And that's interesting to notice that preachers have to preach to little children, young men, and fathers. Doesn't matter how old of a person falls in this category, how long they've been saved. You know, it could be one day a retired pastor comes in here, he's been preaching the gospel for 50 years, knows the Bible frontwards, backwards, and if I stand up here and preach God's word, guess what? He's going to get some of that. There's some things that he needs to learn. There's some things that he needs to be reminded of. And so it doesn't matter what age you are, there's something for you from the Bible. But you know what? You kind of feel like when somebody has been through all that, here's the message that I've got for you. And you've known this to be the case. You've known the him that's from the beginning. You know, there's not really a whole lot necessarily of the burden of the ministry upon somebody who's, let's say, in their 70s, 80s, and again, I'm just I'm just plugging ages in there. This could this could represent different uh, various ages depending on how long they've been saved or whatever. But there's not a whole lot there. That person's already been through it. This person's just starting. They need the encouragement and all that kind of stuff. But I hope you understand where I'm getting. As I read these, and he's addressing these people, what stood out to me 
is when he talks about young men, this is where all the action is. He says, young men, you've overcome the wicked one, right? At least you're in the process of it, at least, right? You overcome the wicked one. You've endured uh, trials and tests and temptation and all that. Look, you're strong. And isn't that the, the case? I mean, young men, children aren't strong. I'm talking now physically, right? Children aren't strong. Maybe they're strong for their age. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Maybe they're strong for their age. I don't know where he is. There he is. Maybe they're strong for their age, but they're not strong compared to somebody down here. I mean, it's Father's Day, right? I was talking about this morning. I, I said, I know our society's kind of messed up on this right now, but there was a day whenever you thought about fathers and you thought about those big, strong hands and and you thought about how he can just fix anything and, and you know, he can always, you know, uh, <laughs> and they started thinking about Brother Justin because I was like, man, if there's a snake, man, he'll go grab the snake. <laughs> if there's a spider, he'll kill the spider. And Brother Justin's like, uh-uh. <laughs> nail needs to be hammered in. He doesn't have a tool, man. He's going to pound it with his fist because he's just a man. And he's not going to cry. And you think about all these just traits of just a man. And I know the society's messed it up nowadays, but <laughs> here's a guy that's strong, right? He's physically able. He's strong. A little children's not, not got that yet. But then you get to a point where you get older, and I really hate to confess this, but I'm getting there, <laughs> where you're not as strong as this category right here. And the young men are the ones with the strength. The young men are the ones with the knowledge, and they're sharp, and they're, and they're on the ball. And all that kind of stuff there they're strong the word of god abideth in them right and so you're preaching the as i'm preaching the bible to these different categories and i know I'm, that john said this is what he's doing but as i'm preaching the bible to these different categories all categories need the bible all categories need god's word a little bit different of a burden on each of us depending on how long we've been saved depending on our age and i would say this the age and how long you've been saved the reason I think it can be interchangeable is because it should be it should be that if you're older you know in a, in a perfect world you got saved at a young age and you've been with it you've stuck with it all these years you've been growing okay and it should be that if you're you know if you're old it's not like you just got saved yesterday you've been saved all that time and so your age should kind of match how long you've been uh, how mature you are in the faith, but obviously that's not always the case. Okay, so uh, we see that the burden is not on the little children necessarily. It's not necessarily on the fathers, right? And many times you think about this group of people. I mean, when you talk about, you know, remember our fathers, you know, a lot of times you're talking about the past generations and the ones that have already put in the work and they've done that. Maybe they're kind of like retirement age. I'm not saying that they're not still serving the Lord, but they're just kind of like they set the groundwork. And now the younger guys, you know, are the ones uh, going through that. And so everyone needs uh, the gospel, but the burden seems to be getting this group to this level right here and getting this group here to this level right here. But then all throughout, he's really talking about little children. My little children, my little children. Because here's a guy that's at this section right here, and he's talking to new believers, and he's saying, I'm trying to get you to hear it. Does that make any sense? I hope, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. All right. So now in chapter 4, he's addressing little children. Okay, and these little children are on their ways to be fathers that have known him that is from the beginning, right? That's our goal. We want to be that kind of a guy who doesn't walk away from him, you know, uh, standing strong on things he used to stand on. He doesn't uh, just kind of throw away his faith and everything that he's he's invested in the Lord, but he's been there the whole time. He's been steady. He's been steadfast and strong. And so now he's going to talk about these other people trying to get them to that stage. Okay, so number one is this. Number one here are the stages, uh, 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 here are the things that will get a person to that stage. Okay, number one is overcoming the wicked one. Overcoming the wicked one. What did he say in verse four? He said, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that encouraging? 
let's say you're a young believer, haven't been saved that long, and he's telling you, look, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are, they are of God. Uh, that's how he starts this chapter. And he's saying, look, there are a lot of people that confess to be believers, but they don't confess necessarily that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They don't necessarily, you know, believe that he's God. They don't necessarily believe, you know, that it's him alone who uh, that is, is the source of our salvation. They believe in him plus works. There's all kinds of false preaching out there, all kinds of false teachings. But he says this, he says, you know, I'm warning you about all these false prophets. But then he says in verse four, he says, little children, ye have overcome them. Now, he's talking to these guys, so it's not like he's saying, oh, man, you have known him from the beginning. He's not talking to young, young men necessarily saying you've overcome uh, the wicked one because you're strong and you've, you've got the word of Christ in you and all that. I think what he's saying is this. You've overcome Satan. You've overcome the false teachers. You've overcome those that are trying to teach a false gospel and Satan is trying to blind your eyes and all that stuff. But you actually received the gospel. You actually received it. You believed it and you overcame that. Okay? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so if you understand that you have the Father and you, just like he says about these uh, the children here, if you understand that you have the Father and, you've, and your sins have been forgiven, you're on your way now to be in, in this category. So the three steps here of, of, of going this step forward, number one, overcoming the wicked one. Now, I already said, the little children, the moment you're saved, you've already overcome the wicked one, right? At the end, look, you're not going to have to worry about, oh, no, what if Satan tempts me? What if I fall? You've, over, you've already overcome that. But now, as a young man trying to stay fast, in the word of God, trying to convince the gainsayers, trying to, uh, uh, you know, just to, to, to stand firm on what you believe, that's going to take a lot of work. That's going to take a lot of effort. That's going to uh, uh, be, uh, obviously, take some discipline. And so here's what the Bible says, number one, in terms of overcoming the wicked one. Number one is this, flee youthful lust. And that's all over the Bible. I'll just read one to you. Second Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay, so one of the things you're going to have to do to, to again, you've overcome in the sense of you're not going to have to go to hell. But in order to just overcome on a daily uh, level, just a daily fight, having these battles in your life, trying to overcome uh, the work of Satan in the flesh, you are going to have to work hard at fleeing youthful lust. You say, well, what are youthful lusts? We tend to read that and think sexually, okay? But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there are lots of things that we can lust after, and really... This is going to be a lifelong journey of trying to learn how to how to combat these various lusts that that enter into our minds and to our heart. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither... Be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. And before we read any farther, you see that there is an indication that probably that's what was going on was a little bit more than just idolatry. We know idolatry was involved, but probably rising up to play and 
and fornication of some sort. We know that when Moses came down from the mountain, he said, you know, Aaron had made them naked unto their shame of the uh, before the enemy, their enemies. And so we know there was some kind of, of, of maybe some sexual stuff going on there. But not, I mean, I think the main application here is that they were just simply taking their affection off of God and putting it on other things. Right. Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, getting ready to tell them, hey, thus saith the Lord. And they're like, yeah, who is he? You know, let's just enjoy ourselves. Let's make our own God. Let's serve what we want to serve. And so they're doing all that. And, and he's saying that they went into idolatry. Where did I leave off? Neither let us commit fornication. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. You know, that's another lust of the flesh. And I didn't get what I want the way that I want. It didn't happen, you know, to please my satisfaction. And so we go into murmuring and complaining and all that. Man, this is a, this is a lifelong, you want to get through that phase. You want to be a strong, wise man who has endured all these things. You're going to have to learn how to not complain about some things. You're going to learn, have to learn uh, how to not give your desires over to something else. You're going to learn, let's keep reading. Uh, now, all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Obviously, everything happened in the Old Testament. You know, we live in a great time. And being New Testament believers, we can look back all, all those things in the Old Testament and say, wow. You know, God allowed all those things to happen, and through his foreknowledge, he knew how we could learn lessons from that, and they would make it into the New Testament, be written down for our learning. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, verse 13 is key. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with that temptation also Make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And then he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So people are, you know, we are told to flee from youthful lust of various kinds, right? We're supposed to flee from idolatry. Basically, all those things that would keep you from following the Lord with all your heart. Yeah. We've got to be willing to sever those things. We've got to be willing to turn our back on those and turn to uh, to God. That's, that's going to be a lot of work. This is a long road, man. This isn't just like, I've been saved. Now what? You know, now, I'm, now I've arrived. No, this is a, this is, it doesn't matter what you do in life. Really, it's kind of that way. <laughs> you know, no matter what you do in life, you sign up for something and say, oh, now I am, you know, now I'm at such and such a job, right? I know how to do everything. No, you don't know anything. It's going to take you years and years and years uh, to figure out how to get really good at that. They say it takes like that, and this probably varies on what the activity is or varies who you talk to or whatever, but they say it takes, what, 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. And so, like, whatever it is in life that you're trying to strive after, you know, I'm just going to tell you right now, 10,000 hours is a lot. <laughs> it's a long time. So let's say in your spiritual life, it's the same way. Man, I want to be a great soul winner. I just want to be 10,000 hours knocking doors <laughs> before, you're, before you're going to get to a point where you say, uh, and then by that time, you won't be proud of the way you're doing. You'll be like, man, I got so much to learn about people and about the way that uh, people understand me and stuff like that. Look, no matter what it is, I want to be an expert at the word of God. Look, there are so many things in the, in the word of God. You can live to be 100 years old and still be like, I marvel at what's going on here but you have to put in the time put in the effort okay and overcome the wicked one and number two to be strong be strong guess who are going to be deceived by false prophets now you're not going to be deceived if you're saved you're not going to be deceived by a false prophet into believing another gospel okay you you, you have already got that taken care of that's why we tell little children look your sins are forgiven you know the Father. Now, when we knock on the door, we come back and say, oh, man, it was great. I was out so late, and I met somebody who was saved. Usually, that person didn't necessarily tell you, you know, a whole list of these things and prove to you how spiritual, spiritual they were. In fact, the majority of the ones that I talk to, and I'm like, well, that person was saved. 
they didn't necessarily show this just overwhelming spiritual, <laughs> you know, uh, life. But they said with their mouth, they said, well, I know I'm saved. Well, how do you know you're saved? I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Well, amen, amen. You think there's anything you can do to your salvation? Nope. I mean, to lose your salvation? Nope. I'm saved. They're just confident, right? They're confident of this. My sins have been forgiven. I know the Father. That's simplistic, right? That's pretty simple, basic stuff. Now, 1 John is pretty rough, okay? There's some stuff in there that makes you think, wow, am I even a Christian? I don't love people like I ought to. Am I even a Christian? I still sin sometimes. Well, yeah, look, it's tough. This is a tough road uh, that we're taking, okay? So we got to overcome the wicked one. We've got to be strong. But the weak people are going to be deceived. Now, I believe there are people out there who are saved. We're just talking about this. There are people that are saved, and yet they've heard so much false teaching. And Valerie and I I have been doing a lot of uh, follow-up on some of the people that uh, have made professions. And, you know, a lot of them not giving very clear answers. And I don't blame any soul winner on that whatsoever. You know, we're preaching the gospel. That's all we can do. We're giving a clear gospel presentation. I believe you guys are. Uh, that's up to the person whether they're going to receive that gospel or not receive that gospel. And so, you know, you talked about the guy being drunk. I would, I'm glad that you got the information down because it's, it, it's a great opportunity to go back and follow up on him. But look, don't ever be disappointed or heartbroken or think, oh man, why are we wasting our time or what? Whenever you go back to somebody the next day and they say, I don't even know what you're talking about, you know? Because we've literally knocked on some doors and it's like they can't barely even remember the experience. They still say that they, you know, it's works, you know, that gets them to heaven. And you, it's real easy for people to get discouraged about that. And that's why some people don't even want to do follow up. <laughs> like, I don't want to know. But no, we need to go back and do what Paul did and confirm those people, right? And make sure they got it. Because just because they said that they got it doesn't mean that they got it. So we need to go back and follow up. But what I found also are sometimes I do believe the person got saved, all right? But they're given some kind of shady answers. And the reason why is because they're still hearing all kind of garbage. They're still hearing false preaching. They're still, you know, confused on that. So they don't give a straight answer. But, you know, you can talk to them and kind of kind of get them uh, through that again. But for the most part... We're still easily deceived if we're weak. Where you can still fall into some false doctrine. I'm not talking about losing salvation, but we can fall into some false doctrine. We can begin saying things incorrectly. Look, man, I know good preachers, good independent Baptist preachers who still tweeter a little bit on Lordship salvation. And I don't think that they're lost. I think they're just, they've just been so confused. And in many ways, uh, that's a sign of a weak person. If they can allow these false teaching and the influence of other people to be like, oh, you know, maybe I'm saying that wrong. Maybe I got to throw in repent of all your sins at the end of my gospel presentation <laughs> or something like that, right? This is somebody who actually has not been strong, I believe, and really uh, focused on this. Look at chapter four again. So. So we talked about this verse. Uh, oh, yeah, make jump, first one. So we talked about this again, chapter four, verse one through four. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay, so he's talking to little children. He's saying you're going to have to be strong. You're going to have to uh, uh, continue in that, because you have, he's, uh, that's in you is greater than he is that, it, that is in the world. And so you have the ability to take care of that. Okay, but... Just continue to remember it. Your sins are forgiven, and you have known the Father. But even though we can't lose our salvation, we need to stay strong so as not to lose the individual battles. And here's what I see a lot of Christians that I know are saved, but they end up losing these little battles, and they keep up, keep on falling into sin, and they keep on uh, going off into uh, 
you know, borderline false doctrine or whatever. And at the end of all this, they lose their effectiveness for the Lord. They lose their ability, you know, to, to really have a standing maybe where they can, they can even uh, uh, be used of God in their, in their out, outreach and soul winning and all that stuff. They lose their effectiveness. They mess up, make such a mess of their lives, right, that then they can't really ever get that back. And we don't want to be that, that way. We want to be able to get to this point where we're not patting ourselves on the back and saying how great we are, but we're saying, I stayed with it. I know him that was from the beginning, right? I've got through this. I've overcome the wicked one. And not perfectly. We're all sinners, of course. And First John makes that clear as well. But I have a stand strong. I've resisted uh, temptation. I have learned the word of God. Again, not perfectly, but I understand basic doctrine and stuff like that. But then finally, what did he say? Overcome the wicked one. Be strong. And the last one, have the word of God abiding in you. Having the word of God abiding in you. Growing in knowledge of God's word is pretty much the bulk of Christianity. I mean, you have to know, it's like it's like on your job. I made reference to, you, you, you start a job, and you think, okay, I am now, whatever, you name the position, I don't know, I am now a, whatever you're doing, okay? Now, your whole job is going to be doing the work, but you don't know what work you're supposed to do until you've learned how to read all the manuals, you've been taught all the instructions, you know how to do that. I remember when I worked at a place, Litton Interconnect Technologies, you say, oh man, you must know about computer programming and all that kind of stuff. I don't have the foggiest, <laughs> okay? I didn't then, I don't now, okay? But we built circuit boards. And I had certain manuals I had to read to be able to build these circuit boards and, uh, and operate the machines and be able to drill all these computer boards and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, I had to learn how to do that. But you know what? I had to read and read and read and understand things. I had to make a lot of errors, mistakes, he called him to the, the, the boss's office, you know, and he says, hey, he just scrapped $40,000 worth of material. And you're like, oops, that was a mistake I'm never going to make again, right? <laughs> this, this kind of stuff happens. Experience, learning, reading, reading, training, <laughs> training. Look, if you don't like learning, you're not going to get very far in this life. Right? Right. <laughs> so in career Christianity, you got the manual right here. You say, well, the bulk of my life is going to have to be living like a Christian. Yes and no. The bulk of your life might be living like a Christian, but you don't know how to do that until you study this thing. And so you start studying the Bible and read it and read it and apply it and apply it. You fall, you make some mistakes, but you get back up and you get back in the Word. And you, that's going to be the bulk of your Christian life. Okay? Now, chapter 4. As you get that, and I believe I'm looking at a crowd where I know I'm talking to women as well, but uh, I know I'm talking to a crowd that is in this area, okay? Maybe not saved for a super long amount of time, but man, you're in the Word, you're fighting the fight, Satan's tempting, no doubt, you're still learning things, you're still trying to figure, figure things out. Um, here's what you're going to find, and I know you, you, know, you probably already know this, here's what you're going to find, the rest of chapter 4. Okay, we haven't read that far into chapter 4, but if you start at verse 7 and you read all the way to the rest of the chapter, here's what you're going to find. It's all about love. It's all about love. How to love God, how to love people. How to love God, how to love people. You say, man, this is easy. You're just going to preach the same thing over and over? Yep, because this is what the Bible says over and over. I preached this morning on Jesus, how he was compassionate. And how men ought to be compassionate as Jesus was. I'm not talking about just accepting of sin and stuff like that, but be compassionate. Well, I'm going to show you here in a second. Being compassionate isn't the first thing that happens to you whenever you get saved. <laughs> Loving people isn't the first thing that happens to you whenever you get saved. Now, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When you're saved, you have the capacity to love. No one even has to teach you, right? You just have that because God gave you that. But... It is going to take constant learning how to do that, learning what love looks like, learning how uh, to do these things. So let's just go through this real quick. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, 
Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. You see how this is like talking to a believer, I mean, a young little child believer here and saying, look, God sent his son to die for you, right? Just like he loved you so much, and forgave your sins and, and accepted you into the family. Now you've got to learn how to love other people, all right? Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he that giveth us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. Whoso shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know, I was talking this morning a little bit about the compassion that I was talking about. I was saying, you know, having compassion for somebody, for instance, you love your children, and so you have compassion for them. You don't want them to be hurt. You still love them or anything, but guess what? When they start walking away from God, when they start doing things that are going to hurt them, whenever they start you know, going the wrong direction, it is not compassionate to just go ahead and let them do it. It's not compassionate to be able to allow them. You know, uh, I was talking about how I've heard of this method of training, of teaching or whatever that says, well... I know you're going to go out and get drunk anyway, so I'll tell you what, I'll buy the alcohol, and if you're going to do it, do it here in the house. Anybody ever heard a story or know somebody who had, whose parents had that philosophy? All right, it's craziness, okay? Well, I know you're going to go out and you're going to do things that you're not supposed to do until you're married, but as long as you're safe, so I'll provide the protection and all that kind of stuff. And Man, I've met friends like that in my life, and I'm thinking, that is not good parenting. Amen. Good parenting has compassion and it has love, but it also stands very firm and doesn't allow them to do uh, the things that they're not supposed to do. Okay, so uh, we are talking about being perfected in our love. And, uh, and here, here's what it says. It says that perfect love casteth out fear. You know, I love my children. And so here's what happens. Some people, they don't have perfected love. And so they live in fear. Well, what if my parents, what if my uh, children hate me? What if I tell them that they can't do that? And they get mad and they throw a fit or they're living in this fear. Do you understand? Uh, that, that, but perfect love says, no, nope, I don't care. You know, I love them enough to stop them from doing that. I don't care if they say they hate me or whatever. I mean, that's just one little example. But, uh, but perfect love comes from experience. It comes from uh, uh, just a lifelong of learning how to do those things and really building up a sincere love for people. All right. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Uh, here's another thing that always blows my mind is that people will say, you know, well, I just don't want that person to be mad at me. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. And yet they are willing to offend God. And they're willing to do willing to do something that they know God's going to be upset with them. But they're like, oh, well, I don't want to offend anybody. So they would rather offend God than offend those people. Does that make sense? Right? That's not understanding love. Right? That's not understanding love. We should be able to just totally uh, be at peace and not have fear because our love is perfected. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Now why do we have to be taught that? Why do we have to learn? I mean, because there's a sense in which, and the Bible even says, you know, it just is naturally within you and you don't have to be taught. But we also live in the flesh. And in the flesh, we are trying to 
give in to the flesh and do what makes us happy, whether it's snap out at somebody, snap at somebody whenever we get mad, or, uh, or whatever the case, right? There's, there's all these inner things that are keeping us from having a perfected love, okay? So we're going through this list. We're overcoming the wicked one. We're being strong. We're studying the Word of God, trying to do all these things so we can get to that point where we're kind of perfected. And the last, go to 2 Peter, if you would. The last thing that's going to happen to you in your life has to do with this love being perfected. <clears throat> second Peter second Peter chapter 1 back to my favorite passage I'd probably preach this more than anything else second Peter chapter 1 so good look at verse 5 all right again Peter saying at the beginning of this he's saying you're saved okay you have like you've obtained like precious faith you're saved you're little children of God right now he's saying add to your faith and then he gives them a list. And I don't think it's just in some kind of random order. Okay, I think this order is here for a reason. And he says, and beside this, verse 5, giving all diligence. Now that's work. Okay, that's effort. Faith is an effort. Faith is, faith is just free. <laughs> okay. All diligence add to your faith virtue. All right, start trying to be good. Start trying to live right. You say, well, I don't know yet. Well, that's why you're going to learn the Bible. You're going to read the Bible. You're going to try to grow and add to that faith. And add to virtue, look at that, knowledge. Doesn't that make sense? Just try to be good. Now, how do I know how to be good? Well, you're going to have to add to that virtue, knowledge. You're going to have to learn what the Bible says is good, what's right, what's wrong. Add to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And the patient's godliness, you see kind of this building of the perfect person here, perfecting them. And to godliness, now we're at the end of the list, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. You see how love is an attribute of the perfected man. Not saying anyone's going to be completely perfect, but if you want to get to the state where you're, where you're working towards perfection in the Lord... You're going to have to learn what love is. How do I love God? Well, you're going to have to spend a whole lifetime of studying the Bible to know how to effectively love God. How do I love my wife? How do I love my kids? How do I love my next door neighbor? Well, you're going to have to spend a whole lifetime of studying God's word and adding to your virtue knowledge and adding to your knowledge temperance and patience and adding to patience uh, uh, brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness charity. We've got to love God. We've got to love one another. And we just got to keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. You wake up one day, you're not feeling so loving. You're not really loving the Lord like you should. You're not really loving your brother like you should. you got to keep on doing it. you got to keep on walking in love. And, and then, uh, uh, again, we, that never stops. That never stops. Even whenever you're past that point, right, now you're teaching others. Uh, maybe you're a pastor. Maybe you're... Just maybe you're actually a father, got people under you, or you just want a lot of people to the Lord, and and you're you're kind of teaching them and instructing them. Now you're kind of like a father to them or whatever. Look, that doesn't mean you're done learning. You're still learning as well. But if you're ever going to get to that point, you've got to go through years of hardship and try, you know, enduring, overcoming the wicked one, learning how to be strong. Guess what? Guess how you get strong? You know how you get strong? You got to lift. Okay, I'm talking about getting strong muscles, okay? you got to lift really heavy things until it tears up your muscles, right? And it hurts really bad. There's no way to get strong without hurting, all right? And then after you hurt, then you begin to grow a little bit, and then you're just going to tear them up some more. And then you, you heal a little bit, and you tear them up. That's the nature of getting stronger. And everything in life, man, if you want to get stronger in your love, in your relationships, right? If our marriage was just totally... Uh, you know, never had any problems, everything was all smooth, probably wouldn't grow quite the same way as if you every once in a while have some pain, have some heartache, go through some rough times, and then it can get stronger. And that's the way we got to do uh, with, with this, uh, with the Word of God, overcoming the wicked one, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and being strong in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. Help us not take it for granted, Lord, as it's just some 
magical book that sits on our shelf, but help us to, uh, to take it in and to learn and to grow. Help us be reminded of the fact that we're saved, uh, our sins are forgiven, and we've known you, Lord. We have you, have you in our hearts. And, and then help us, Lord, to, to live a life of labor and diligence and adding to our faith. And walking the, the, the tough road, getting stronger, being being uh, faithful and consistent and, and all these kinds of things so that we might grow, Lord, in knowledge of your word. And then ultimately, we might be effective and be able to better show our love one for another and uh, also to the lost world and uh, and see see folks saved, be effective for the kingdom. Lord, we love you. want you to be glorified. And all that's done here, blessed message. Uh, as we receive it in our hearts, give us safety as we go our separate ways. Jesus, in my heart. Amen.